Hi, it's Paul Knopfler here, UC Davis, stem cell researcher, and this is the second episode where I'm answering questions from uh, readers of my blog about stem cells. I've got my list here of different questions. Today I'm going to try to go through six uh, questions. We'll see how far I get. Uh, I just had some dark chocolate covered espresso beans, so hopefully I'm all like wired up. Uh, so first question is, um, what do you think, Paul, of supplements for stem cells, like endogenous stem cells? So I'm pretty skeptical of these. I've seen uh, different companies offering like post-stem cell transplant supplements. I've seen other companies you know, saying they have some kind of supplement that will mobilize your own stem cells uh, to somehow do you some good. You know, I don't know that there's much science behind that. You know, you'll see papers occasionally. I saw one recently. Um, I think it was a few days ago saying vitamin C somehow targets cancer stem cells. You know, other people think maybe vitamin C might be good as an antioxidant to protect stem cells. Same kind of goes, same thing kind of goes for, you know, other antioxidants. I've heard people claim things about them. But, um, you know, it's pretty tough to find convincing research suggesting that taking a certain supplement, um, you know, is helpful or in some kind of meaningful you know, predictable way uh, for our stem cells. So I'm not really, you know, buying into that whole idea. Um, I have posted before more generally about the idea of like somehow boosting <clears throat> one's stem cells. And, you know, I've, I've, I've done posts before about the idea of boosting one's stem cells through, you know, changing a lifestyle or something like that. You know, maybe that's possible. And, and some of these things include like changing how much sleep one gets or the idea that exercise, this one's there have been papers on this, you know, over the years that exercise actually increases our number of stem cells, which is an interesting concept. I think there might have even been a paper about Tai Chi and stem cells, um, you know, probably leading a generally healthy lifestyle is not a bad idea, not only from a stem cell perspective, but just uh, more generally. So uh, another question, and I've gotten this one many times over the years, is when they're out, stem cells can be helpful for arthritis. And so there's a lot of different kinds of stem cells out there. Um, you know, some of them, I'm not sh so sure it makes a lot of sense. Like there's a lot of uh, people talking uh, in the stem cell clinic world about using amniotic stem cells for arthritis. I don't know that that makes much sense. Um, you know, I suppose one of the first questions one has to ask in that kind of situation is, are, are these amniotic cells even alive? Is it some kind of extract? Either way, you know, how would it actually work? You know, is it somehow mediating uh, repair itself or is it stimulating endogenous stem cells? So I'm pretty skeptical about that. Um, not so sure about adipose stem cells for arthritis. Um, you know, from, from the get-go, one of the issues there is that that's, I think that's non-homologous use. And so, um, you know, based on the FDA draft guidances, those are probably drugs. Uh, that I guess in almost all cases with the clinics have not received an IND or some kind of approval from the FDA. So I think with adipose stem cells, you know, I would have to see a lot more evidence uh, that, that that makes sense. Bone marrow stem cells, you know, I think logically, sort of from a common sense point of view, that kind of makes more sense that those cells could be helpful. They're not so far removed. I don't, I don't think most uses of uh, bone marrow stem cells uh, would be non-homologous use. Uh, those cells are generally not more than minimally manipulated, so, um, and w one can imagine as well, like there may actually be some chondrogenic potential there, like those cells could actually grow new cartilage. That would be a cool thing, you know, if you have bone on bone to get some new like articular cartilage in there. Uh, I don't know for sure whether that actually happens or whether those cells could reduce inflammation, mobilize, you know, existing cells, things like that. So I think, um, for me at least, uh, it seems like it's still kind of early days for stem cells for arthritis. I think there's some real potential there. A lot depends on um, type of arthritis. You know, I'm, I'm thinking more about osteoarthritis so far, um, and also the type of stem cells used. So I also got some questions this week because um, there's been a lot of tension about this paper that came out um, yesterday from a group in China where they CRISPRed uh, viable human embryos. So people wondered like how, how big a deal that was. That was something I kind of asked myself as well. 
I think it's it's not entirely surprising. You know, a lot of us have heard rumors that CRISPRing of uh, healthy human embryos was something that was coming. You know, even last year I thought we'd probably see a paper like this, but we didn't. Now we've seen it. Um, you know, I think there's a few sort of bullet points one can imagine that, uh, and I blogged about this, you know, from this kind of paper, um, there was higher efficiency in this context as opposed to the use of non-viable embryos. I don't know why that would be for sure. You know, the genome was abnormal in those non-viable embryos, but I'm not sure why that would affect CRISPR efficiency. Um, I guess another thing that came out of this paper was that chimerism is really a, a major issue. Uh, this paper was focused on introduction of CRISPR into one cell embryos, zygotes, and so there I think um, it's very likely that one would, would see chimerism pretty often, and it might make more sense scientifically um, to go back a step developmentally and actually CRISPR um, primordial germ cells or just the germ cells themselves or even, you know, something like iPSLs. I gave a talk about this last week at the Future of Gene, uh, Genome Medicine meeting uh, down in La Jolla. Um, you know, this is assuming one actually wants to go down this path of, of uh, genetic modification of human embryos uh, for research purposes. Um, you know, some people are talking about doing this for clinical use, you know, down the road in, in the actual germline. I think at this point, that's a pretty wild idea. Um, I guess the other thing coming out of this paper that was pretty notable is that they didn't always get gene edits, uh, you know, precision modifications, um, and at least one case they got an indel, which is like an insertion or deletion introduced that, um, if I read it right, was kind of like a knockout of the gene, and, and certainly that's something you wouldn't want to have happen, you know, in a clinical context. So I think we're far removed from this kind of technology being used to actually create a human being at least in a responsible way, but that doesn't mean someone uh, may not attempt it. So um, I'm guessing we're going to see a lot more papers like this, uh, and I'll be curious to see which journals they come out in, you know, are any of them going to kind of crack into the top journals? Uh, and an interesting question in that regard is, are those journal editors sort of acting as gatekeepers uh, for some of this? So another thing uh, came up this week on artificial embryos, so another embryo thing. This was in mice, um, and so this was a paper in Science, and um, the researchers combined uh, trophoblast stem cells and embryonic stem cells and got things that looked embryo-like. Um, I think it's kind of a neat technology. There have been other papers uh, out there uh, that similarly have been trying to make things that kind of go beyond what we, we think of as embryoid bodies, like things we can easily make in a lab, uh, you know, that have some semblance, even remotely, uh, of uh, similarities to embryos. Um, you know, I'm guessing this technology will be really useful for different kinds of, you know, addressing research questions. I saw in the media it got a lot of sort of hype about, you know, are we on the road to, like, uh, making actual embryos this way, and I think that's a long, long way off. In this particular paper, they weren't able what they made was not really an embryo exactly. There was, you know, some uh, types of uh, cell lineages were absent, etc. So, but it's certainly intriguing, you know, raises some interesting questions. Um, another question I, I've gotten from people um, who read my blog is, you know, what exactly uh, is stem cell epigenetics? Because that's something I have often said, or epigenomics is something I say I'm interested in. So um, some of you may be familiar with this and others maybe less so, but um, this is a really interesting area. You know, you can, you, you could probably talk for hours about it, but in a nutshell, you know, if you think about an organism, all, all the cells, with some rare exceptions, because, you know, apparently even us humans are kind of like microchimeras, but for the most part, our cells all have the same um, genome, you know, the same uh, genetic information but they behave wildly differently, right? Like some cells are pluripotent stem cells uh, in the early embryo, other cells are neurons, hair cells, skin, etc. So the way they behave differently is because their epigenomes are different and the epigenome is a combination of different factors like DNA methylation, histone modifications, and there are other mechanisms there. And so I, th I think, for me, this is a really exciting field. There's a lot of sort of emerging uh, really cool areas of, of research within stem cell epigenetics, like things like uh, chromatin looping, where you can take things that are, you know, megabases apart, but 
in a linear way of thing, thinking of things, but that's really artificial way of thinking, is really with looping, they're actually right next to each other. So I think uh, 3D chromatin uh, configuration assays are really interesting. Um, and you know there are non-coding RNAs that are really interesting that regulate epigenetics. So for me, you know, working on pluripotency, thinking about reprogramming, also thinking about cancer stem cells, um, the whole epigenome side of things is uh, really exciting. So I have a bunch of other questions. I don't have time to answer them today, but send me more questions and I'll keep doing this every few weeks and I'll see you later.